All right, and you are live. I'm going to drop, and the floor is yours, sir. So I'm utterly delighted to join you all and share with you a concept that we call useful fiction, or sometimes called fictional intelligence. Basically, what it is is a blend of nonfiction research and analysis with narrative, with storytelling. And in particular, this is a project that we did with the Cyber Solarium Commission uh, that many of you are probably familiar with. This is the uh, bipartisan commission that was tasked to think through both the future of cyber threats, but also US government cybersecurity strategy. How do we handle it? And we were asked to help generate out a vision of the key themes from their report, but packaged through scenario. And it actually was the introduction to the report itself. So think of it as a vignette, but also akin to an executive summary. And um, it goes as follows. A Warning from Tomorrow by Peter Singer and August Cole. You spend your whole career on Capitol Hill hoping for an office with a window. Then when you finally get it, all you wanna do is look away. They set up our emergency offsite for essential Senate staff in vacant offices once belonging to one of the contractors that lobbied us before they all went belly up last year. The offices are in a high rise in Roslyn with a literal million dollar view. Looking across the Potomac River, you can see past the National Mall and the monuments all the way into downtown DC. And it just breaks your heart. The rainbow of colors in the window paints how everything went so wrong so fast. The water in the Potomac still has that red tint from when the treatment plants upstream were hacked, their automated systems tricked into flushing out the wrong mix of chemicals. By comparison, the water in the Lincoln Memorial reflecting pool has a purple glint to it. They've pumped out the floodwaters that covered Washington's low-lying areas after the region's reservoirs were hit in a cascade of sensor hacks but the surge left behind an oily sludge that will linger for who knows how long. That's what you get from deciding in the 18th century to put your capital city in low-lying swampland, and then in the 21st century, wiring up all its infrastructure to an insecure network. All around the mall, you can see the black smudges of the delivery drones and the air taxis that were remotely hijacked to crash into the crowds of innocents like fiery meteors. And in the opening spaces and parks beyond, Tiny dots of bright colors smear together like some tragic pointless painting. These are the camping tents and makeshift shelters of the refugees who fled the toxic railroad accident caused by the control system failure in Baltimore. FEMA says it's safe to go back now that the chemical cloud is dissipated. But with all the churn and disinfo on social media, no one knows who or what to trust. Last night, the orange of their campfires was like a vigil of the obstinate waiting for everything to just return to the way it was, but it won't. A knock on the door shakes me out of it. It's a legislative director checking back in. She's anxious because the boss promised that we get a draft of the bill out tonight to all the other committees that touch on cybersecurity. No cars are online and nobody wants to risk the Metro after what happened on the blue line. That'll mean hours of walking from office to office. At least the irony of backpacking around paper printouts of new cybersecurity, cybersecurity laws will be lost on no one. I tell her that I'll get it done and turn back to wordsmithing the preamble. I mostly mind the language from old legislation that someone just like me wrote after the 9-11 attacks. I know some online troll or talking head on the news will end up calling it lazy, but it's the closest anyone can think of as a parallel. Of course, with all the servers down, our poor intern had to run a paper copy from the Library of Congress. It reads as follows. Whereas, for as long as the United States has been a nation that invented and then became dependent on the internet, it has faced online threats. And whereas these threats grew in scale and frequency, we grew too accustomed to digital interference in our society, economy, and even elections. And whereas, AI and automation change these networks from use not just for communications, but to connect and operate the things that run our physical world. And whereas a new type of vulnerability thus emerged, where software could be not just a means of theft, but a weapon of mass disruption and even physical destruction. 
And whereas our government and industry failed to keep pace with this change of technology and threat, being ill-organized and ill-prepared, and whereas these vulnerabilities have just been exploited in extraordinary acts of treacherous violence that caused massive loss of life and effectively held the nation hostage, and whereas such acts continue to pose a threat to the national security and very way of life of the United States, now, therefore, be it resolved by the Senate and House of Representatives of the United States of America and Congress assemble that the government of the United States must, must what? What can we really do? No matter what legislation we pass now, after everything that's happened, we're too late. In 2021, I mean, critical infrastructure is having all these challenges and somebody still can't hop on without being on mute. Um, so uh, I was just joking not to start things off on a somber note, but of course that was the, the fictional story that you put for the Cyberspace Solarium Commission, as you noted. Um, so let's let's step back, right? You, you mentioned this concept of fictional intelligence, which is using story, storytelling to help educate and bring around understanding awareness and change, part of what we're trying to do here at the village. How did you first get into that? So the background to it is in many ways, August Cole and I stumbled upon it in a project called um, Ghost Fleet. And uh, it was a combination of a techno thriller novel. It looked at um, what a war between the US and China and Russia might look like. But um, we were both nonfiction guys. Uh, you know, I have written nonfiction books on, on cybersecurity and more recently the weaponization of social media, teach classes on it at graduate school level. Um, in turn, August had been the defense beat reporter for Wall Street Journal. So when we were building this novel, we couldn't help ourselves and actually conducted years of research and showed it in in the book. Um, so it was a novel, but with, I think, 27 pages of research endnotes. And the rule in it, as we built it, was you couldn't just dream it up. You couldn't do like, you know, related to cybersecurity where someone goes, you know, click and clack, we're in. No, you had to have the citation of here's the threat intelligence report. Here's where this type of attack actually happened out in the wild. Often um, the US conducted against someone else. And then, hey, maybe someone might do it back against us. And um, the combination of the two of this nonfiction and narrative fused together really took off. Uh, it obviously sold really well, um, but that package, and it's sometimes called fiction, or also you might think of it as useful fiction is what we also call it. Um, it proved to be the most influential work of our careers. I testified to Congress, I think four times on it. Um, three different government investigations were launched to essentially fix things that we had identified inside our novel. Um, gave briefings on its real world lessons everywhere from the White House Situation Room to the Nobel Institute to Cyber Command and NSA um, to the deck of an aircraft carrier, you name it. And so it just struck us that uh, this combination had, had great power. And it, again, it's, it's the fusion that matters. Um, a techno thriller, science fiction, you know, I love them, but they're like a milkshake. They're entertaining. Um, they're not designed to be good for you. In turn, um, a, a PowerPoint briefing, a white paper, a trend report, that's like handing someone, you know, uh, a fistful of vitamins and say, take it. Um, and, you know, most people will be like, I don't want it or I'll ignore it. Um, useful fiction. It's what I did to my kids this morning. It's a breakfast smoothie. So you're sneaking the good stuff into that package of a story. Um, so the, the value sell of it is um, one, they're more likely to read it. Um, two, the science, not to get wonky with you, but the science shows that um, they're more likely to, it's more likely to stick with them uh, when you, read a white paper, when you, you listen to a PowerPoint, whatever, two parts of your brain light up. When you get that same information package and story, four parts of your brain light up. And then one of the other really cool things about it is um, good story hits with emotion 
And is everyone from a you know salesperson to um, a politician know emotion is what drives the sale? And so that example that we did for um, the Cyber Slam Commission, it was targeted not just to capture the key themes, you know, what critical infrastructure threats might look like in the future, but it was also trying to connect to an emotion of their target audience, which was you don't want to experience this simulated, this synthetic experience, this character like you, a congressional staffer was their target audience. They feel regret. Do you want to feel that too? Oh, read this report, put this legislation into action, you won't have that negative experience. So those are some of the value propositions of the idea. And, and it's been awesome since then, um, you know, we've done it with Congress, we've done them for corporations. Um, we're doing a project right now for um, the British government and the US Marine Corps. It, it, the concept has really taken off. It's been a lot of fun. So how did you get tied into the Cyberspace Solarium Commission? Is that something where they recognized the value of this based on what you and August had done previously and said, we want that to help get more impact with when this report comes out? Yeah, they they um, actually approached uh, on that, and uh, you know it was it was uh, it was awesome. It, it was um, a very, really how to put it. Um, the best kind of projects are the ones that are important and intrinsically interesting, which is a nice way of saying fun. Um, and so you know the Slam Commission, obviously hugely critical, but also to try and pull back and go okay. This is, I mean, I have to go, what was it? It was a, um, I'm looking real quickly, 182 page report. Okay, how do you take the goodness with that, that 182 page report, boil down its key themes, some of its key recommendations are even buried within that story. Uh, for example, there's a little offhand reference to um, uh, public private. There's another offhand reference to um, too many committees touching on cybersecurity and sort of the frustration that staffer feels. So basically it's, it's like a riddle how do we take those themes and boil it down into a story? And so, you know, we boil it down in this story of a of a staffer, you know, trying to figure out how to write legislation the day after the the equivalent of a massive um, level of a critical infrastructure attack like we haven't yet experienced. But people like you and I, um, you know, who work on the also the research, I go look. These are real world threats, whether it's water systems hacks. You'll notice there's no part of it that's the the lazy, um, oh, the power grid might go down. I mean, that is a real threat, but we go beyond that because that's one of the key issues that we see looming is um, it lays out again, you know, it might be water systems, it might be transportation networks, it might be when we say water systems, there's different types. There is the chemical levels, there's the the um, reservoir systems that that control the water level and rivers. Um, you know, we can go on, there's uh, GPS hacks against um, aerial systems. All of that's going to get a lot more interesting when it comes to greater use of um, drones and delivery or the like. So it was basically this riddle of how do we capture that, tell that story in a way that also links to emotion. I'll give you another fun example though, of one that we did um, that I uh, was with a, um, a, a corporation. Um, we were trying to figure out um, for C-suite leaders, uh, how do you convey you know, the experience of um, why they ought to act uh, to protect networks? You know, as, as everyone knows, it's, it's not everyone, as, as people in the industry know, um, you know, it, it's often not how do I convince the CISO of the risk, it's how do I convince the CEO and the board and the, and the chief financial officer. And it can't just be, well, the network might get hacked, that they're aware of that. And so we we created a scenario which was their nightmare scenario. And it's um, the day, it's a couple of days after a breach, a ransomware incident, going back to predicting the future. You know, we've seen a lot more of these recently. Um, but it's not, you know, the nightmare scenario for the CEO is not, oh, my company might get hacked. Um, the story is set um, as a CEO is sitting in row 27 of a commercial flight, so they're in the, the worst of coach class, as they have to fly to Washington to testify to Congress about the breach. So for them, it's the, and you'll remember the, the um, 
executives a couple of years back who got caught, you know, in their private jet. So now they all have to fly commercial. And so it's this experience of, you know, what is my, the lead, it's not network getting hacked. It's how will I personally have to deal with it? And I'm going to have to fly coach and my board's angry at me and I'm going to be yelled at by a bunch of members of Congress that I just have to sit and take it. And so it's again, setting up that this is why you need to act, um, not just, oh, the network might get breached. How do we connect it to an, uh, a scene and emotion that they care about? So I, I'm guessing that you, you didn't have a background deep in industrial control systems prior to a lot of this research. And I think that's kind of an interesting thing because there's such a depth of technology. Um, and when we talk about critical infrastructure, wow, that sounds like a simple two words put together. The fact that that's 16 different SSAs and the various technologies, it gets a lot more complex. So how do you approach the research process to get technically smart enough? So as you said, you are, while you're not peddling the vitamins, that you're at least staying true to the nutritional formula. Yeah, that's that's a great question. And it, it, it you know, it's, it's uh, how to put it, um, to continue that, uh, it, there's a recipe, right? You know, so making a good smoothie, there's an actual recipe to it to get the nutrients and the taste side. Um, so a lot of this was, uh, drawn from the work that we did for a more recent product called burn in, uh, which, which uh, you and I actually got to chat, um, a, a while back. Um, burn in was a, it's a, it's a book, um, that's a package of useful fiction. Um, it's a story that, that follows a hunt for a terrorist who's um, going after, uh, IOT, um, about 10 years out and um, so we get to see uh, what are the different ways that we're going to be using IoT more broadly as we weave in greater amounts of automation and AI because to me that there's a common it's not just that we're moving to an internet of things it's it's an intelligent uh, network um, but we are seeing all sorts of vulnerabilities baked into it and we it opens up new um, both threat actors and types of attack. And that's what burn-in was capturing. Um, now, uh, the research for it took about three years and it involved everything from, um, you know, pulling up uh, threat intelligence reports and, and actually, you know, presentations that are, uh, you know, at places like a DEF CON of folks showing off what they've been able to, to, to do, uh, showing some of the vulnerabilities that are out there. In addition, um, interviews, interviews with experts from across, you know, everything, you know. So if you want to know about um, water systems vulnerabilities, there are extensive threat reports on it. But I also did interviews with both um, uh, analysts at cybersecurity companies all the way up to um, executives. And one of the interesting things about that was, and it hit when you were talking about the multiple different sectors, is basically got into um, talking about um, why the cybersecurity industry was drawn to market and provide more services to some parts of critical infrastructure than others. There is, to put it bluntly, sort of a market structure that makes some types of um, markets more profitable than others. Um, water is an area where, um, if you look at the structure of the industry, it's a lot of um, mom and pop size companies they're not large regional companies. It's either mom and pop size private companies for the most part and or a local county, city, or even town water authority. And the structure of that means that, oh, and on top of that, the regulatory agency for it up until recently, not interested in cybersecurity. Its focus is on pollution. So there wasn't a lot of kind of attention steering the way. If you look at, for example, a parallel like, um, you know, set aside banking where all the incentives are aligned to cybersecurity um, in terms of, you know, there's the, the, the monetary value is very clear. Um, power industry, you know, there you've got everything from there's been more attention paid to it to larger companies that have larger budgets and the like and so you get that from interviewing the cybersecurity companies why are they not spending much on it why are you not marketing as much to them to the other side of it um i interviewed water systems engineers the people that literally designed the water networks for major cities 
like Washington DC, which is where um, the story is set. So, you know, and you get, when you talk to people and, you know, you'll have a lot of this and, and um, you know, networking and, and uh, conferences like, you get, you know, sort of the formal answer and then you get the stories that people tell over drinks, right? Oh, you'll never believe what we did or you'll never believe what we saw. And so that's where, you know, we get the, the goodness. That's where we get the real world ideas is from either real world experts or real world reports. Um, a different way of putting it is we, we call it the no vaporware rule. There, there can't be anything that's sort of just drawn out of vaporware, either, you know, a technology that doesn't exist or something that's purely imagination sake. You know, again, I love my sci-fi, um, but if it's so far out in the future, or so vaporware, it's not as useful. And that's also, I think, the frustration a lot of um, people in the cybersecurity field have towards um, depictions in pop culture is, you know, like I said, it's either, you know, it, um, it's like click it clack, I'm in, you know, or it's um, the people in it are not realistic, right? You know, I mean, I, I like Mr. Robot, but, you know, everybody in the field is not like that. Uh, yeah, so uh, where you were talking about where it comes to money, this is something that we've talked about a lot here is that um, in a regulated industry of which a lot of critical infrastructure has different forms of regulation, which when we're talking about regulation, it doesn't just mean security. It also means that rate basis. I can charge more for electricity than I can for water. My ability to spend that money back in increasing a, you know, pushing a rate cost to customers has to go through a public utilities commission for approval. And so that restriction drives a lot of those kinds of changes um, to what can be done. Uh, and with, of course, 2021 was like the year of industrial control system hacks. Um, you don't have to predict the future when the future keeps happening every other week. We started with, you know, with solar winds, which had a large impact. We had the Florida water hack around the, the Super Bowl. Um, the irony of that one is that exact same hack is what we've been demonstrating here physically in the ICS village for several years. Uh, and is the, and thank you very much is one of the key scenario. We don't want to plot spoil burn in, but was one of the key scenarios in it. And, and again, you had the Florida one, but the Florida one, um, you had earlier the attempted one on the Israeli water networks. And so, you know, when people are like, how did you predict this? How did you depict this? Like the information is out there. Um, it's more about putting it together, uh, it's, you know, connecting the dots. And then you have, you know, what we were talking about earlier, which is that so much, um, in, particularly in the cybersecurity field, is not how do I explain this new thing? It's how do I explain it in a way that my target audience will take it in, will understand it? How do I get and hold their attention? How do I put it in manners that they're more likely to act upon? So it's, it's, it's the communication piece of it that's often more of the challenge. I mean, it's very rare to think of um, any, you know, major cybersecurity incident that we had not had a series of them beforehand that were smaller or they were demoed at a, at a conference or whatever, the information was out there. We just weren't, weren't willing or able to act on. And that might be true for a nation, definitely the case for corporations, right? So if you could give us any insights or share, um, what's kind of the next project or um, anything around that you're, you're allowed to talk about? Yeah, so um, <laughs> August and I, August Cole and I turned it into a business. Uh, we were having so much fun doing these, you know, kind of one-off stories. Um, and we realized that the demand was there, you know, so if there's one group that's like, we've got this strategy report, but we can't get people to read the key ideas of it. Um, they're not the only group in the world that has that challenge. Um, we also have been doing uh, training courses with um, different groups on how do you do forecasting? How do you do communication? And that came out of the Air Force approached us and said, um, it was the Air Force uh, Blue Horizons, their futures team. They um, they said, you know, don't, don't create the scenarios and, and we just wanna, we, Y'all have predicted well, teach us how. And so we put today a two day course for them. And so basically, you know, um, 
essentially what happened is we looked around and said, hold it, clearly this group is not the only one that has strategy reports that people won't read or trend reports that they need to hold attention or the Air Force is clearly not the only group in the world that's wrestling with how do we do forecasting well. And so after we had a couple of these one-offs, we're like, let's turn it into a business. And um, we've been doing more and more of them. We've done them with everyone from, um, as I mentioned, private corporations to to NATO. We're in the middle of um, one right now with uh, the Marine Corps and a different one with the British government. And they've been, you know, going back to what we were talking about before, uh, they've been fun. Um, they hopefully have a great deal of impact. Actually, we, we know they have a great deal of impact. We've got the numbers to prove it. But um, more important, they're just it's been it's been intrinsically interesting. Uh, it's also been fun for me to sort of learn how to be a small businessman on the side. Uh, so that, that's been an interesting experience. So with all of the stories that you've written, what's the one thing that still keeps you up at night? Um, uh, I don't know, my kids, um, but no, uh, the bio side, um, you know, we fear what we don't understand and I'm able to, you know, kind of wrap my head around, um, you know, the IOT infrastructure, um, the, the bio side as we've, how to put it, um, we've lived, and when I say bio, I mean bio threats, um, uh, engineered disease, you know, it's been, the last year and a half has been bad enough. Um, and we've, and it's been bad enough because we've seen the um, kind of deliberate uh, spread of disinformation around it um, of, you know, everything from, you know, what can you do in masking to vaccines to um, the willful kind of ignorance of it. So I, I, how to put it, I guess I'm not expressing this well, the bioterrorism side keeps me up at night even both because i'm i'm i don't well understand the biologic side as much as i do the physics or etc but the second is the experience that we've had in the pandemic um makes me you know kind of more worried about it because you know it, it goes to like the reason why none of the zombie movies would work anymore because you know essentially you'd have a bunch of people walking up to the zombie saying well, i don't think you're real uh, you know or, or like you know i'm not gonna run away from the zombie it's my choice you know whatever like that's what we we're living right now with coronavirus and so this is a disease that is awful it has been has not been the type that might be engineered when you think about, you know, what might be in the hands of a bioterrorist five, 10 years out, particularly as it moves into um, the DNA to the genomic side of things. So that's what spooks me. Um, uh, yeah, um, I hope I, you know, hope, hopefully that part stays in the realm of fiction. Let's hope it stays in the realm of fiction and clearly George Romero's career would have gone a different way in the alternate universe you just described. Yeah, the, the internet really um, ruined, you know, whether it was the, 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 you know, Day of the Dead or Dawn of the Dead. I mean, you know, I, I love those movies, but um, I just don't think the, the plot would survive a world of um, Facebook and Twitter and Instagram. You know, think how it would warp everything in those stories. Um, yeah. uh, any final words uh, as we kick off DEF CON 29 here with the ICS Village? No, it, it's it just, I really appreciate the opportunity to join you. Um, and I also appreciate the, the incredible work that people have done over the years um, in uh, the village and the like. I mean, it's, it's, it's helped me individually as someone, as a researcher, as an analyst, as a professor, but it's also served the wider world. I mean, it has had a real positive effect and so i'm just like to be able to talk to you uh, and kind of join that cohort and may defcon 30 be hopefully safely available in person for all of us next year indeed <laughs>